Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining and I apologize. There'll be a few pings coming in and out while we while we um, get everybody into the room, but I'm really excited to have you here today. Um, I think we uh, is very telling that um, this is an exciting moment where we have a lot of cross collaboration between nonprofits and researchers and, and corporates um, and, and research centers and, and this, this session around data and digital revolution for food systems uh, inspired so many, uh, so much interest. So we're thrilled to have you here today and thanks for being a part of this um, community and, and we really hope to build really inclusive um, engagements here. So um, thank you for inviting your, your communities, your networks, um, everyone within the ag space. Um, and we have a lot of great speakers here today. And so I wanted to, um, we'll start off today um, actually with uh, Parmesh Shah, who um, I will, uh, Maxima will be joining very shortly. So I think we're going to change up the order a little bit. Um, so bear with us as we get everybody into the, the session and all of these little things going on. But um, with that, um, I'll hand it over to Parmesh. Thanks a lot, Rika. And it's a pleasure to be at this kickoff of this Global Coalition for Data and Digital Revolution. It's very apt uh, post COVID. We have realized uh, what's happened to the agriculture and food system. We knew it was distorted and it was not working well, but I think the fault lines got accentuated. Now, since we are at the COP26, uh, one of the most important things is that the climate events are not within the control of any of the stakeholders in the food system. For small farmers previously could uh, look at their microclimates and take decisions, but now uh, the decisions they take have to depend on what's happening outside their immediate uh, climate ecosystem. And which means that they need information about what's happening on weather, what's happening on other things which are happening outside, which means they require more uh, precision and data and intelligence analytics from various sources. And that makes the thing, uh, the, the future of the agriculture and food system will have to really look at data to enable adaptation and mitigation to happen differently. Smallholders uh, have a double disadvantage that they can't afford access to these information. So we need to look at how the public goods are developed around uh, uh, around accessing these data in a different way. The second major change which is happening is uh, really the innovations which are happening in the uh, in the in the digital technologies all over. And we are now have six thousand nine hundred ed tech startups globally now uh, right now. And uh, those ed tech startups, when you talk to them, and we did a study, we found that. 80% uh, of their time is spent on collecting data and only 15% time on products and services and 5% on scale. So we are facing a major issue where a lot of innovators want to innovate and create innovative products and services, but they don't have access to uh, analyzed data and data sources in a way that the products and services and innovations could increase. Our estimate is that if this data is accessible, uh, the, the, the innovations will quadruple and the people will, farmers and all the people will get different kinds of products and services. So I think there is a possibility of a product and service revolution in the agriculture and food space, which is hampered by not having a platform of uh, data and innovation, which is accessible to wide variety of stakeholders, particularly the young startups, the young generation, which wants to come into agriculture and food. The third part is the possibility to digitize. And I think if all the farmer, 450 small holder farmers were registered in a digital registry, then you could see a lot of people could access that data and develop very innovative products and services. The same is about the research which CGIR has been doing and lots of researchers are doing, but that's not digitized. So digitization of various kinds of transactions, data, foundational data would also offer an opportunity. And, the, and, and now the things can be digitized. 10 years back, that was not possible. And the final thing is about the whole uh, innovations which are happening on uh, you know, uh, innovators and accelerators and incubators. You will be surprised to know that in agriculture and food, there are only six incubators and accelerators globally. 
So, so with such a big sector, if you take compare it with fintech, we are almost at one hundredth of the size of innovation of what is there in other sectors. So this means that there's a big case for a huge platform to be developed on data and innovation across agencies, across stakeholders, across public private, across technology companies and agribusiness companies, across okay. tech startups. So I think what I what we feel is that this particular initiative really will help us to bring a most a broad based coalition of people who are in the business of data and innovation around agriculture and food and also attract people who have not worked with the agriculture and food systems in the past to come and work on this because this is foundationally a very important challenge the food security challenge the nutrition challenge and the the food supply chain challenge these are very important challenges for future they could also create new kinds of jobs and new kinds of entrepreneurship models which currently are uh, you know uh, very 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 at a very low level of equilibrium there and at the world bank we are committed we are committed to uh, really working with this coalition and this cannot be done by one agency so this requires a very intense uh, coordination and, uh, and and an effort at a global level of a different kind so the two things we are doing right now is that we want every bank investment to be informed by data and innovation policies and investments. And we, we are looking forward to this initiative to really help us develop uh, uh, this kind of a proof of concept now in about eight to 10 countries globally fairly soon. Uh, we are two products we are working on. One is the global uh, data food system observatory, which will bring all this data together and to enable data use analytics and use cases. The second is an innovation accreditation facility where all the people who are innovating can come on one platform and offer their innovations as a global public good to anyone who wants to work with them. So I'll, I really uh, am looking forward to hearing because uh, I, I think a lot of uh, people who are passionate about it, who care about it and who want to transform the food systems are here. And uh, we hope that what comes out of this coalition will help us inform our future work in this area. Uh, thank you very much for being here and I look forward to uh, listening from you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Parmesh. Um, and and uh, I, I think I'll kick it over now to Maximo. Well, good, we've got you in here. So um, uh, please go ahead and take it away. No, thank you. Thank you so much. I am Maximo Torero, the Chief Economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. And it's a pleasure to, to be here uh, and to be part of this global coalition for digital food systems innovation. So as all of you know, and this was mentioned before but by our colleague, there is an urgent need uh, for a broad data and digital coalition to transform the agri-food systems. Uh, and during the Food Systems Pre-Summit uh, and Summit, FAO expressed interest to collide with partners this important coalition. The data and digital ecosystem is fragmented and incomplete with many systems actors working in silos, despite there is such a huge need at this point in time to have this information available and ready to support countries in all the tough policy decisions they have to make every day. Digital solutions, data sources, institutions uh, and alliances working to transform the agri-food systems and other, and others both human and environmental challenges uh, must bridge scientific disciplines, market systems and social and political realities. It's no longer one field that will explain the problem that we are facing. Agri-food systems are extremely complex. Is that we are mixing issues of land, water, soil, climate, weather, extreme situations, socioeconomic variables, uh, and over time in, in multiple dimensions or over the space. So it's a multidimensional problem, a multidisciplinary problem that we need to, to find ways in which we can bring all this information together. FAO plays a key role in promoting the use and adoption of digital technologies to facilitate the transformation of agri-food systems. And we have been working uh, to address this uh, and try to massify the amount of information that we can share with our member countries. An initiative needs to be inclusive and safeguard basic human rights for all. And that's where we are developing uh, a data and a statistical uh, a code of conduct and, and uh, so that we can respect all the norms of property rights, uh, the norms of confidentiality of information, and of course, security. 
creating demand in rural areas to be based on digital public good provisions, uh, also stress in the digital cooperation report and roadmap using innovative models. So to focus on increasing demand, we need to identify and promote digital services to address low perceived relevance and attractiveness of content for users in rural areas. And there are so many uh, amazing things that you can do today. You can even take a picture uh, in insurance, for example, and automatically will go to your system. It will automatically predict the probability and, and also quantify your loss. And that will go to the insurance company and from the insurance company to the reinsurance company. But also we can use the same type of digital technologies to identify health issues in plants, problems in soil, so that it can go up to, to global clinics that can respond and minimize the cost of having to have physical extension services. So we have to work on this and we have to bring together all these technologies. And data and digital solutions are key to improve early warning capabilities, something which is central today, especially with climate and, and, and extreme temperatures and extreme amount of rainfall. Uh, we need to be able to have some predictive power. And for that, we need real-time data over the space so that we can give early warning mechanisms to the farmers that are producing today, especially to the small farmers. Because as we always say, if someone has to do precision farming, it's the small holder, not the large one, because it's the one that has the bigger budget constraint. So they have to use their inputs and their resources in the most efficient way. We also need to improve data-driven investments so that we can, for example, identify optimal locations of storage facilities, mobile storage facilities, so that you maximize accessibility, you maximize location of production, uh, and you maximize access to energy and to digital services and financial, financial mechanisms. We also need to use data to de-risk, to increase the resilience for the most vulnerable, and to provide digital financial, financial services, attract the startups, and improve digital transformation. Now, the, the, the overall objective uh, is to identify global data and digital innovation solutions, gathering intelligent data using digital tools from inputs all the way through the consumer that hits multiple needs, ensuring financing, due diligence, and the risking extension services, nutrition, inclusivity, social impact, and improved policy outcomes. Innovating, iterating, and investing in digital service for food system transformations, and this will imply business models of all sizes, shape for the different varieties that we can find and the different models of agri-food systems and can be powerful drivers of transformation. And also we need to align data standards and we need to create the foundation of public good data. The coalition, we are suggesting involve three main working groups and solution clusters to help catalyze in country-led innovation to transform the agri-food systems. The first one is Future Marketplace Playbook, which is develop and support transparent, inclusive digital pathways and sustainable models, enabling farmers and consumers to build more efficient, climate smart markets for nutritious food. One map, which develop data agency and consent management mechanisms linking the small agri food businesses, policy makers, and digital service providers to generate foundation data assets for digital food systems innovation and interoperability from individual to global scales. And the digital data cornucopia, which brings together a consortium of organizations to co-develop a common resource efficient data infrastructure to facilitate data use and sharing for food system analysis. For FAO, data is at the core of our DNA and we are doing enormous investments to try to accelerate the process of the data that we have by trying to bring real-time data and, of course, geospatial data. Our new strategic framework applies four cross-cutting sectoral accelerators, technology, innovation, complements, which is governance, human capital and institutions, and data. In all the programmatic informations we do in so that we can accelerate while at the same time minimize the trade-offs of the activities that we're implementing. And remember, our goal is to achieve zero hunger also reduce poverty and reduce inequalities because it's the only way we can be sustainable. But for that, we need to understand the trade-offs over all the other SDGs. We believe the International Platform for Digital Food and Agriculture could play a crucial role in this. And FAO is hosting this International Platform of Digital Food and Agriculture, as well as the Federated Big Data Solutions of the Hand in Hand Geospatial Platform. The granularity of the 1,000 Digital Villages Initiative and the innovative holistic design of the Green Cities Initiative. FAO Hand in Hand, your special platform is a digital public good that all of you can access 
and it tries to create interactive data maps, analyze trends, and identify real-time gaps and opportunities. Another example is the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration laid by FAO and UNEP that includes several partners of data and digital coalition like the WEF, the World Economic Forum, and the World Bank. The framework for the ecosystem restoration monitoring is built on the Hand in Hand Geospatial Platform. And this framework of global is a global platform for transparent monitoring of ecosystem restoration, enables people, communities, and countries to access the latest information, data, and technology, and produce their own restoration information and monitor their own progress. The, this, this firm provides access to geospatial information related to ecosystem restoration and provides basic advanced applications for monitoring. Data and digital collaboration will also accelerate collective action through transparency and publicly available geospatial information. This is central because making data public allows us to assure the quality of the information. And if problems are identified by the users, then we can fix them. And this could be a significant contribution for the Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals. FAO will play a key role in engaging with member countries on their data needs to achieve deforestation, free supply chains, and large-scale restoration, and to build consensus on transformational, transparent, and open data pathways. And at the same time, we focus on capacity development in least developed countries through innovative technical solutions, which is also a key role of FAO. The Global Forest Resource Assessment FRA is an FAO flagship and core mandate to access to assess globally within the UN system and on a regular basis forest resources and analysis progress on the deforestation and deforestation. FAO has embraced the concept of the digital FAO to create the open access to hand in hand geospatial platform to provide member countries, decision makers, and wider audiences with the open of transparent data and relevant information. And FAO stands firmly committed to working with partners for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life leaving no one behind. And we believe data and geospatial data, like the one we provide in the Hand in Hand Geospatial Platform, will allow us to achieve this, these four betters. And for that, we need digital technologies as the core. But again, the crucial role of this coalition is how we make this enormous amount of data together with similar standards, similar rules of the game, but accessible to the major users, which in our case is the farmers and especially the smallholder farmers, so that they can really benefit and profit from this information to make better decisions and to be more efficient in the way they produce, in the way they link to markets, in the way they eat their nutritious food, and in the way they make their work sustainable, taking into account all the three dimensions of sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maximo, and, and appreciate you bringing in the lens around public goods and, and smallholders. And I think we'll continue with that theme with, um, with Brian King, who um, from, from Platform for Big Data, um, we'll hand it over to him to talk more about the, um, the broader coalition and, and what we're trying to do um, with a little more detail. Over to you, Brian. Hmm, thank you. Uh, my name is Brian King. I serve as coordinator of the CGIR platform for Big Data and Agriculture. Um, we heard from FAO and actually some data released during the COP26 meeting that um, food gen systems generate some 30% or more of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is caused by land use changes, um, much of it related to agriculture, deforestation, on-farm practices, food distribution, food waste, uh, all the way through to food retail and, and consumption. Now, we know that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and, and we're joined in the conviction that food systems can be a key way that we drive and balance public good, climate, biodiversity, nutrition, and development outcomes for humanity and the planet. Now, we're also joined by the conviction that data-driven interventions, innovations, and digital technologies and services can be critical enablers and potentially transformative parts of the solutions that we seek. Under the innovation lever of the recent UN Food Systems Summit, public, private, and nonprofit actors came together and are represented here um, out of that recognition and seeing particularly that public, private, and nonprofit actors all have a role to play in sourcing, fostering, and scaling potentially world-changing data-driven interventions and digital innovations in agri-food. 
And so part of what we did um, with through the summit and with facilitation from WEF and FAO and other partners was to hammer out some collaboration principles that we think gets at the heart of how do we um, how do we coalesce, how do we join. And so I want to spend a little bit of time describing those principles and and suggest some ways that we can go forward from here. So the first of these or the first one that I'd like to talk about is this concept of innovating responsibly. We know that data and digital technologies can be quite transformative. We also know that we need to be engaging multiple stakeholders in the governance related to those technologies so that we can claim their power, but also mitigate their risks. And there are great frameworks and, and ethical uh, frameworks and guidelines out there for guiding um, such an effort. So we will need to take those on board and we need to be continually kind of refreshing and reviewing the suitability of those frameworks for how we how we innovate. Um, the next one I'd like to talk about, and, and this was alluded to in, in the introductions, is this concept of fostering data agency and enabling responsible sharing of data. We talked about the, 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 the constraints related to data availability and standards and accuracy and, and quality. And in many times, you know, very, they're perfectly legitimate, very good reasons why data might be restricted. But at the heart of those questions are questions about agency. Who decides how to share data with whom, what sort of um, representation rights might they give to another actor to, to work with that data, and, and what benefits do they see as a result? And how do we architect and design in a way that we can enable the sharing of data that can drive the data-driven interventions, enable the better development of those services, and how do we ensure that that right can always be revoked and that we're not undermining the agency uh, of data owners? Building an inclusive digital revolution is the next principle that um, that we've we we arrived at uh, together, and this is built out of the recognition that we know that digital services and digital technologies and so forth are expanding globally, um, pretty quickly, um, but they're expanding unequally, and the there are kind of built-in inequities in, in you know in our in our socioeconomic context. We could say that you know um, those technologies go and they interact with, and it's and it's not a neutral thing. And so we need to recognize that we need to be designing for real human needs in the context of that complexity, um, so that we can arrive at the best quality solutions and we can behaving in a in a in an inequitable and fair way as much as possible. We don't need to presuppose, for example, that everybody is going to be a user, but we do need to know what the human context is within which these technologies and data uses are, are happening and, and design and, and proceed accordingly. Um, iterating and sharing learnings has been evoked a, a bit already, and, and I think this is pretty fundamental to what brings us together. Knowing that we need to keep accelerating our learning, keep trying to find the transformative solutions and be sharing data and evidence and learning along the way so that we can accelerate our collective learning and we can continue to make progress because we know and we agree um, that it's a matter of urgency. We need to be finding solutions and, and getting them into, into action and into place. And then the last of these principles we call, uh, we say, be force multipliers. And what do we mean by that? Um, it's a recognition that there is a lot going on. There's great work. There's lots of stakeholders and actors uh, trying to kind of organize vis-a-vis -vis each other. And, and the goal is not to be, through this coalition, to be kind of crowding out other efforts. If anything, it's about trying to crowd each other in around the goals that we try to, try to um, goals and outcomes that we're, we're trying to bring um, into being. And so through you know, aligning and linking up initiatives where actors are, you know, doing something, we can build some kind of light touch coordination and communication and deepen our technical collaboration um, across efforts. And, and this um, starts to help us to arrive at a kind of functional level, agile governance, um, uh, I, I think, you know, and I think we're starting to see a little bit in terms of the actors that are coalescing um, already. And so I think um, just a couple of uh, additional things before I finish. One is I'd like to underscore that the principles are meant to be substantive. They sound great, you know, in principle, that they're sort of hard to argue with. 
Um, but they, we'd like to indicate, you know, that they actually mean real commitments. And so, for example, sharing data and evidence means sharing data and evidence about failure. Um, it means being transparent and open to critique from other coalition members uh, and from the public at large, because obviously it's a it's, you know, food systems are as multi stakeholder um, as they get and any intervention in them is also is 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 is, is quite sort of driven by multiple stakeholders. Um, and so I'd leave you with a few calls to action. First of all, if um, in your organization, um, you feel that, you know, initiatives that you have um, ongoing kind of resonate and would fit and, and you know, would, would benefit from linking up across initiatives, um, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to colleagues from World Economic Forum and we can uh, capture a little bit of information about your initiatives, the impact you're trying to have, where um, particular digital or data interventions that you're doing, and we can try to serve as uh, matchmakers, you know, first multipliers um, across those initiatives. And so it's open and synergistic with any aligned um, um, efforts that, you know, we could sort of link together. And if your organization doesn't yet have uh, an initiative um, or doesn't wish to align an initiative yet formally, um, you know, it's also possible to endorse the principles um, and that does give us some 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 ways in which we can collaborate and coordinate and 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 communicate as well. Um, I'd like to underscore that this is not done in isolation of country development strategies. And in fact, we need to be anchoring in and trying to find ways that we mobilize the partners, the capabilities on offer of this growing coalition, and and make make it clear that. Um, country partnerships are a fundamental way that we do this and, you know, um, uh, governments, um, uh, national um, ag development agencies, um, other initiatives, you know, are, 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 are kind of part of, you know, how we anchor this and, and, make, and make these aspirations real um, with and through country development strategies. Um, and lastly, you know, an innovation uh, uh, invite, you know, there are there's prototyping, there are minimum viable products, there's testing around services that we'll learn a little bit more about today. And so please um, come and be engaged and, and we'll be force multipliers together. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And, and just um, want to do a special shout out for um, Brian, who's been so fundamental at the heart of driving these coalitions to come together and to um, continue progress uh, and, and implementation. So um, thanks for all the work that you do in bringing this group together. Uh, I'm going to hand it over next, you know, on that theme of how do we, how do we work with governments? How do we get to scale? How do we actually drive towards um, supporting smallholders with real products and services? Um, we've, uh, today we've got Dr. Mandefro from the Ethiopian ATA. So I will uh, hand it over to you to talk a little bit more about um, the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you so much, Erika, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm very pleased uh, to join these intellectuals uh, who are presenting a high-level uh, speech. So Ethiopia is an agrarian nation, and uh, the country has developed a very ambitious uh, development plan or strategic plan for the next 10 years. So. This development plan has a very ambitious goals and uh, targets. In addition, Ethiopia is uh, trying to transform its food system. <clears throat> so the two ambitious uh, goals and targets can only be achieved if we can do uh, three things. One, uh, if we can improve uh, existing agriculture and rural development policy and practices. Secondly, if we can collaborate with other sectors uh, horizontally as well as link uh, vertically. Uh, so this link could be within the country as well as with, with international community. The third uh, item in order to realize these plans, uh, goals and target is digitizing uh, what we are doing in the area of uh, agriculture in terms of education, research, extension and marketing. So having that, uh, Ethiopia went to do a roadmap of the digital agriculture. 
in order to develop a very productive as well as implementable roadmap engagement of the stakeholder is critical uh, why do we engage uh, stakeholders along the food system or along the value chain is that many organizations are doing different pieces you know alone and uh, they also generate data uh, information and they do some sort of analysis and they put the results uh, in silos so having the engagement of these different actors can help ethiopia develop a very productive roadmap so who are these actors you know we have actors from the private sector actors from the public sector civil society organizations uh, think tanks uh, for example the world bank uh, bmgf digital green uh, cgir centers jz these are few examples that we have engaged in terms of developing this roadmap uh, so this roadmap because of this engagement can really help us in terms of gathering data analyzing data and uh, packing the results of the analysis so that we can promote it to a smallholder farmers to improve productivity to improve income as well as uh, livelihoods of the primarily a smallholder farmer but also improve livelihoods and incomes of other actors along the food system or the value chains so the benefit of bringing in the different uh, stakeholder is for all not just for the agriculture sector alone by having that uh, what do we do we can generate appropriate data that can be used across these institutions within the country as well as outside the country and uh, we can have a better ecosystem a better infrastructure as well as a better products that goes in the form of applications for a specific services so we have taken the principles of this coalition in terms of generating data together and uh, storing that data uh, processing it and utilizing it not only within the country but also across the globe so we share what we have learned and we also learn from other countries and uh, the principles of this coalition is critical in the area of gathering data processing it utilizing it across the nation not just uh, by one institution or by one country but for multiple institutions as long as we have a very good uh, data uh, sharing policy and a very good uh, integrated uh, data collection uh, processing and uh, utilizing again uh, when we have this kind of uh, data uh, gathering uh, and uh, knowledge sharing uh, system we can have uh, different blocks within uh, the system one is in the area where we have data and knowledge uh, storage area this is about research in the universities and the other one is organizations who do really process or take the results of the knowledge source and pack it in order for farmers or other actors to use it and the last mile is those who are using and improving their productivity uh, income and the livelihood so those are the key uh, elements of uh, the roadmap that ethiopia is uh, trying uh, to develop and uh, at the same time when we join this coalition we can benefit a lot from the scientists from the systems to be developed and from the data to be gathered and shared so i would like to stop in there and uh, once again thank you erika and thank you all
Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that. And and um, now I'm going to hand it over to Tule from um, from the ATO in in Kenya um, to talk a little bit more about the uh, national agricultural strategy there. So. Let's see. Great, thanks Erica. Um, it's such a great pleasure to be um, part of this panel among such distinguished guests. Uh, good evening, Minister in Ethiopia. Um, as the ATO, as the Agriculture Transformation here at the Ministry of Agriculture, we're responsible for supporting the ministry in its road towards digitalization. We say digitalization or digitization. Um, and similar to Ethiopia, we have a number of ambitious plans for transformation of the sector. Um, through our agriculture sector transformation growth strategy, which has a strong anchor in digital and data um, innovation and research. And fortunately, Kenya, um, we already have a vibrant private sector um, ag tech ecosystem. And as a ministry, we recognize that we need to focus more on leveraging these platforms and tools rather than reinventing the wheels. Um, and this has not been more evidence um, in our response to the desert uh, locust infestations we experienced in 2019 and then later in 2020. With the World Bank, along with FAO, two partners here on this call, um, helped our crowding in of digital tools for the ability to track and respond to uh, locust swarms in our communities. This has helped us lay the appropriate foundation for a predictive early warning system which will leverage data, of course, but um, digital platforms, and we are now building on that. Um, in addition, we have worked with various service providers uh, from ranging from banks, um, private uh, telcos, uh, to assist in the deployment of our move towards smart subsidies deployed through e-vouchers. And of course, uh, the big data platform hosted at Cairo, supported majorly by the World Bank, um, which has been a great investment in building the appropriate infrastructure. Uh, required for the entire sector's ability to move towards digital, uh, both for the systems and for the data hosting. That said, we have not had our fair share of um, teething issues. Um, changing the old guard for one has taken some work and it requires continual investment um, in the availability of hardware, uh, but also the retooling or upskilling of our people, especially in the ministry. But um, as the ATO, we're working on a change management implementation plan right now um, through the Institutional Capacity Strengthening Plan. And this will help the ministry move with the times um, and you know, internally, but also, um, um, have also engaged with the recently established uh, Data Commissioner's Office, uh, because I heard from uh, Brian King's mention about making sure we foster a responsible sharing of data. And it's important for us because we recognize that as the e-voucher program has grown and our pharma electronic data registries have grown, there's a lot of sharing of data and we need to make sure that it's done in a responsible manner. Um, but uh, fortunately, many have embraced the use of technology because they recognize one, it's, it creates flexibility in the way they work, but also whilst increasing productivity. Um, I know this is more a discussion on the data, but for us, data and digital are um, synonymous, because how else will you store or collect the data if you don't have the digital platforms? Um, but we also have had some resource challenges. Um, I need to create a more focused mindset on ongoing investment in data ecosystems. So part of why we agreed to participate in this coalition and why we're always looking towards this coalition to support uh, that transformation and assist us in making the shift from data being a by the way um, for the way for in the way that folks work on a day to day, but to fundamental activities, our decision making, as well as budget making processes. So in the short term, we're still looking to the coalition to support resource mobilization so that we can um, leverage what we have already done um, in the smaller pilot phases and now move towards scaling across our 47 counties. So that is my submission, Erica. Thank you so much and really appreciate you speaking to um, both the incredible successes as well as some of the challenges that that, that you're facing. So um, thank you for, for, for sharing with us. Um, and I guess to build on um, to some of the, the commentary on um, the, the systems in Kenya, I want to kick it over to um, Helena, who has been uh, with Consumer International to talk a little bit more about the Marketplace um, Coalition. 
Awesome. Hi, Erica. Hello, everybody, and greetings from Glasgow, uh, where it's currently raining, but has been glorious all week. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to share a little bit of an executive snapshot of some work we did um, around a topic that we're truly passionate about. Um, just as a segue, I don't know whether you know, Adam Smith in 1737 went to Glasgow University when he was 14, just down the road. It's within walking distance of here, thinking, and he, of course, said that agriculture is the foundation of the economy. How amazing is it that we are standing, sitting here now, thinking about how to reinvent and rethink about that economy so that it works for people and planet now and for the true wealth of nations. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about um, work on, which we called the Marketplace Playbook. I am here representing an awesome group which included Mercy Corps, uh, of course, the, the wonderful humanitarian group, Dahlberg, Toule was with us in that journey and a number of others. And our question was, if we now take consumers and farmers and connect them, recognizing and starting with their intrinsic needs and apply data and digital to that in an ethical and responsible way, what kind of business model might you find? And to make it uh, even more applicable, can we find business models that are workable in low and middle income countries? Let's, let's see if we can really find the business models of the future. Are they out there? And take a very pragmatic view. Um, we asked, what do these business models look like? What do they do? What sort of support did they get? How might we be able to uh, grow them? The first part was to start with the needs, not only of the smallholder farmer who needs to be at the heart of this, but also the needs of the environment, of society, and also of the consumer. I don't know how many people on this call know that consumers have rights. Um, they are important. They are the way in which we can change the marketplace, because once you know you have rights, you can fight for them. And those include education and access to uh, sustainable consumption. Okay, So if we then start with the consumer and the farmer and we think about the ethical way in which we can apply data and digital to that, um, you really start to, to imagine and look for something which can feel quite, quite difficult to find. We actually found 30 in a very short space of time, uh, 30 business models which we think could address some of these needs around the, a, a circular value chain. And we found 12 examples so far, but that's just after eight weeks of looking. And in India, in the People's Republic of China, Kenya, Ethiopia, Chile, and Argentina. So let me talk about some of the examples there. Rey de Alimentos managed to, in Chile, managed to reach 260,000 vulnerable consumers with food that otherwise would have gone to waste. The government support there was actually a tax reform. Uh, which allowed them to do delivery of food that otherwise would have been lost. Uh, we took Twiga Foods as one example from East Africa, which has increased farmer revenues by 30%. They're very much around sort of data apps um, and the support of the Kenyan government, as we've heard. Uh, in India, companies like AgriBazaar or Simply Fresh, these have started only sort of in 2015, 2016 with, with very significant growth. And then I think a, a really exciting and interesting example is Pinduoduo in China, which now serves 788 million buyers. Um, uh, you know, you can see the growth of these potential platforms. And if we can orient these business models towards the needs of people and planet, uh, what more can we do? Briefly, we said, if we are to advance this, there are probably three types of, of approach that can be important for us to look at. Responsible digital platforms, collaborative data management, and innovation hubs. And I, you know, I think it'd be really interesting to explore those a little bit further with some of the other speakers. But of course, data standards have to cut through the entire piece. Um, so our work going forward, and this is an open invitation to give us feedback, pull things apart, build with us, um, is really to, to um, start to think about how we build uh, those examples, how we look at specific countries to help um, and think about how uh, the, the um, 
what needs to be in place uh, for individual country pathways, and then also dig into some of these uh, specifics like data standards. Um, it is so important, though, that as we are doing this, we are including the farmers and the consumer advocates who can see what is happening on the ground, never innovate for the person unless they're included in that process, that we have transparency and that we're building as we go our ability to interrogate the interface, um, to really understand what's going on and get that feedback. And frankly, that we go fast. Uh, consumer advocates here at COP have asked for a fast, a fair and an accountable transition. Um, everybody, I hope, knows now um, the more we save now, the more we invest now in this change, the better it will be and the faster we will reach a tipping point to a healthy, quality um, future for all of us. So thank you, Erica. Back to you. And I, I, I apologize if people are going to have nightmares about this doorbell forever moving forward. <laughs> I wish there were a way to turn it off. Um, but thank you for, for, um, for that. And I'll hand it over to, um, to Elliot from the mineral team. Uh, thank you, Helena. And thank you, Erica. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Elliot Brandt. I lead Project Mineral at X, which is Alphabet's uh, so-called moonshot factory. Um, you know, I'm really privileged to be on this panel and, and among these great uh, colleagues. I'd like to start my comments with so, uh, the personal, my personal journey of the painful reality of, and the difficulties of building data solutions in the food system, uh, because this is a very challenging undertaking we're talking about. 15 years ago, I ran a traceability company tracking billions of items of food through the global supply chain. And while there was incredible power of connecting farmers to consumers, a major barrier to making the maximum use of the data flowing was the lack of interoperability between each of the systems that the food passed through. Even in the US, there, there was no and still is no standardized way of identifying a field, which is sort of amazing. It's not available in the US, it's not available anywhere. Ten years ago, I was a CEO of another company, a tech company applying AI to provide food recommendations to consumers about nutrition and allergens. And in that case, a lack of data standards meant there could be 10 different ways of listing sugar on an ingredient label. Again, lack of standards really inhibited innovation. And then five years ago, I joined X to help the global food system adapt to and mitigate climate change by transitioning it to a sustainable and regenerative future. And we knew that one of the biggest challenges we would face was the fragmentation of this industry and the siloing of data that you've heard all the co my colleagues talk about. In addition to all of that, in recent years, we've seen an erosion of trust in data, in digital technologies, and in many of the institutions responsible for handling it. And that also has hindered collaboration and the achievement of agriculture's critical contribution to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Like some of the other folks on the call here, I, I came back from COP last week, I actually got back yesterday from Glasgow, and I was very inspired by how high food systems were on the agenda at COP for the first time, uh, and how important incentivizing innovation in the food system is going to be. So I think it's incredibly timely. It's why the initiative I want to talk about called One Map is such an important and timely undertaking. One Map is an open data architecture for agriculture proposed by a diverse group of experts from um, folks on this call, such as the FAO, the World Bank, CGIAR, multiple NGOs and technology companies who I want to say thank you to, such as Hewlett Packard Enterprise, GeoGlam, and Digital Green. All of these individuals have contributed their expertise and their painful lessons to come up with a solution that we think can be part of the greater system. This group's insight is that a resilient food system, essential nature positive services for farmers, and the critical analytics about the food system requires a new system of trust. So let me describe one map and how we think it will create that system of trust. Visualize four concentric layers that make up one map, similar to the framework that uh, Mandefro laid out for Ethiopia. At its core, the core layer is high quality farm level data collected by any number of actors that could be collected by governments, NGOs, researchers, or by the private sector, and collected in a way that allows farmers or a data trust on their behalf 
to give those farmers agency and choice over how their data is used. So that's the core, right? Let's establish data trust at the core. The second layer, and this really leverages important recent breakthroughs in machine learning and cryptography, the second layer allows us to derive insights from these data, such as modeling carbon, modeling greenhouse gas emissions, making yield estimations, monitoring pests and diseases. This second layer uh, is enabled by technology, but also min maintains the protection of the underlying private data. That was very difficult to do in the past, and it's now technically possible. So first layer core data, second layer protecting that data and drawing insights from it. The third layer is an architecture of shared data standards that you've heard several other people talk about that enable the data to be shared, the models to be shared, and the results to be shared without friction across different platforms. Those could be across government agencies and across different enterprises. That friction has often held up real breakthroughs. So third layer, shared standards and architecture. And finally, and maybe the most important, the outermost layer, the fourth layer, are new digital pharma services which could be public sector, they could be extension services, it could be commercial, it could be from com established companies and startups, like the examples that Tule and Helena just gave. These, these new digital services provide, improve pharma economics, improve pharma education, or improve pharma sustainability, and will improve pharma resilience. So that's, that's the, the ball of yarn, if you like, that, I, that we see OneMap creating. Now, there's a common adage we've heard, which is you can't manage what you can't measure. But it's also true that you can't incentivize what you can't measure. And one of my biggest takeaways from COP was how important it will be to realign incentives to get the outcomes we need. So one map creates a system of trust that breaks down the barriers to measurement and unlocks those services and incentives for farmers. and will put us on a path to greater sustainability of agriculture. So in sum, if you remember one thing from what my comments, OneMap develops data agency and consent management mechanisms, a system of trust, linking small agri-food businesses, policymakers, NGOs, investors, and commercial service providers in generating both foundational data and new analytical assets that will enable innovative food system services and interoperability, both at the individual smallholder farmer and all the way to global enterprise. So I'm really excited to be talking about this uh, and, uh, and I'm very excited about the future of OneMap as part of this system. Thank you, back to you, Erica. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, Elliot. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over now to build on that concept of um, data collaboration, data sharing. I'm gonna hand it to the um, representative from the Cornucopia group, Jess Fonzo from Johns Hopkins, if you were there. Great, thanks so much, Erica. Um, and thanks for having uh, Johns Hopkins and Global Lines for Improved Nutrition and Google who, who started talking about this data cornucopia. I'm gonna actually talk quickly about three things and I'll, I'll try to be very fast that all come together and coalesce around this data cornucopia. The first um, project that we've been working on is the Food Systems Dashboard. This is a partnership between Johns Hopkins, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, and FAO, um, but it brings uh, together about nine organizations uh, at the core and six additional partner organizations. And what it does is it combines data from multiple sources to give users a complete view of food systems Users can compare components of food systems across countries and regions and identify and prioritize ways to sustainably improve diets and nutrition in food systems. So we have about 200 indicators uh, that we have on the dashboard and it presents a very visually appealing um, graphs and other ways to look at data to help decision makers in understanding how their food systems are performing. And um, building on that, uh, a group of us came together to start looking at food systems performance. What are the best quality indicators that we can pull together to really understand how food systems are performing to meet the SDGs and other global goals. And so 
a group of us, about 50 of us from 27 uh, academic institutions, non-governmental organizations, and UN agencies, mainly FAO, have come together to develop something called the Food Systems Countdown Initiative. Uh, we've published our first paper on the countdown, really the framework and the architecture of how we'll do this over the next decade. That was just published in the Food Policy Journal. Um, and we'll be tracking the highest quality indicators uh, of, of food systems performance over the next 10 years. And just to, as a um, letting the cat out of the bag, there's not a lot of high quality indicators to look at food systems performance. So <laughs> the list is pretty short, um, but hopefully that will improve over time. Um, and then last is the data cornucopia. And this was really an effort working with Google um, and Johns Hopkins, which is really a global food systems data coalition where we want to unite individual repositories and networks to build capacity and align the global accountability mechanisms across food systems. So there's a lot of different groups that are trying to improve food systems data, creating dashboards, creating repositories, creating networks. How do we come together and align our standards, develop a set of common criteria um, around data infrastructure to um, minimize cost of, of building these sort of repositories and databases and dashboards, align the kind of data that we collect and curate and overcome some of those technical challenges around data quality standards, around the lack of data, around is in, insufficiently interoperable data. And that's what this data cornucopia is all about. And we will be helping to bring together different partners, collaborate and coordinate, try to address some of these barriers and align existing repositories, networks and information systems. So much more to come on that, but those three initiatives are really meant to provide open access data in very visually appealing ways. That's the dashboard um, to find the best quality data for governments to be able to track the performance of their food systems. That's the countdown. And then the coalition is to facilitate collaboration and coordination. And I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, and, and now I'm going to hand it over to um, Tanya Strauss for the World Economic Forum to talk a little bit about um, the momentum coming out of the UN Food Systems Summit and some of the upcoming work um, that WEF will be doing in, in, in driving this. So over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Erica. And this has been a fantastic conversation today of breakthrough thinking and partnerships and bold leadership from so many organizations and countries. It's been really inspiring to hear. I think on behalf of the World Economic Forum, we're, we're really delighted that this is also uh, part of a broader COP26 live program, which strengthens the links between food, land use, diets to that climate action agenda over there in Glasgow where, where Helena is sitting and so many others are as well. And I think that's what these global milestones this year have really started to demonstrate. We need these communities and strategies and thinking to come together across climate and environment and food. <clears throat> and innovation and especially data and digital can bridge those divides to Helena's point faster. So I think what we've really learned through this year, whether it was through COVID or through the UN Food Systems Summit and here at COP is that improvements will come from creating open processes that enable partnerships across public, private, civil society sectors. And also that we must redefine innovation in its broadest sense to offer pathways that address quality and equity of more resilient, climate smart and healthy food systems but also how the needs and opportunities will vary from country to country and community to community. And that complexity and diversity further enriches positive outcomes. I think the, the Global Data and Digital Coalition being discussed today as part of a 
broader innovation framing and network aims to support countries and communities to meet national and regional priorities on food systems transformation pathways. This was a major kind of shift and threshold cross during the Food Systems Summit. And I think uh, many speakers already have, have linked and aligned around that. And I think some excellent examples um, shared from Kenya, from Ethiopia, and from other others who are sort of leading that charge. Um, during the Food System Summit, together with Mercy Corps, and I know Jada is also on the line, we, we co-hosted the Innovation Lover for Change, and nearly 80 organizations engaged in four areas to foster innovation, including national and regional ecosystems, societal and institutional innovation, of course, data and digital tools, and knowledge and technological innovation. And now turning to a next phase of action and um, collectively kind of bringing those pieces together to help those countries realize national and regional food systems pathways. There are several delivery partners and, and I think several of the organizations on the line already. I just wanted to point out a few of those now and to, to colleagues on the chat in terms of how these will link together. I think the 100 Million Farmers Initiative, a farmer-centric platform to increase investment in innovation for nature positive production and promote innovative practices through tech science, but also indigenous knowledge systems, policy governance and data and digital to support farmers and farming to transition to net zero and net positive outcomes. We've heard from others around the, the food innovation hub. So these are dedicated and dynamic local innovation ecosystem networks that's set up to scale knowledge tech, data and institutional capacity at the country level. And there's several of these already underway and working together with what Maximo was talking about around hand in hand, um, but also some of these other data and digital country level next steps could be an exciting um, you know, set of ways to align and scale. We also were working around the societal and institutional component of innovation. And actually there was a UN dedicated discussion that I think is still in, in kind of discussion in the post summit um, phase around the future of food systems collaboration, a UNDP um, together with other UN agency led initiative that's offering practical tools, capacity, systems leadership, and collaborative methods that could be customized to context and interest. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one. And then from the forum side, in addition to engaging in all of those, we're glad to also bring a wider set of partners outside of the traditional food community, including our work with the partners on the 2030 Vision Initiative, uh, which is a public-private partnership advancing the fourth industrial revolution technologies in support of SDGs across several sectors. So to bring and harness a lot of that uh, innovation network into this food space, I think has, has enormous, enormous potential. Um, Erica, I think across the board, and we know innovation can unlock so many of these complex barriers, but we need to continue to work together to sort of unlock innovation itself. Um, but I think these definitely hold some promising next steps and a tremendous thank you to all of the organizations and countries and individual leaders stepping up to demonstrate, take risks, and lead, and you can definitely count on the forum uh, as well on that in terms of next phase. So looking forward to working with all of you. Back to you, Erica. I really appreciate it, Tanya. Thank you so much. Um, and for our final speaker today, I'm here to close things out. Um, is it Jada McKenna? Or please pronounce, correct me if that's it. Yes, no, it's, it was perfect. Thank okay. you. Welcome um, from, from Mercy Corps um, to, to take us home. Great, thank you. And um, thank you everyone for your contributions and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to join this panel today. Mercy Corps was very proud to co-chair the innovation lever for the UN Food System Summit this year, where we were very involved in the work of the data and digital working group, particularly the future marketplace playbook. It's exciting to see the great ideas from working groups now becoming real forces for change. We've heard today from speakers across the data and digital landscape describing how we can use collaborative, innovative approaches to solve some of the world's most urgent problems. Whether it's through new data infrastructure for food systems or innovative frameworks for efficient climate smart markets, there are real solutions for making food systems work better for people and the planet. We heard powerful stories, not just of innovation, but of collaboration. Dr. Defro spoke of how critical multiple stakeholders were in developing a digital agricultural roadmap for Ethiopia, 
which benefits everyone, not just the agricultural sector. We heard how Kenya worked with partners, including Mercy Corps, to crowd in digital tools to respond to desert locusts, as well as how they are moving towards investing in longer term systemic change to take advantage of such innovations. These solutions could not come at a more important moment. My organization, Mercy Corps, works in uh, all around the world and our global teams witness daily how the converging crises of climate change, conflict and COVID-19 are fueling hunger and food insecurity. 2020 marked the sixth year in a row where global hunger and undernutrition were on the rise with 155 million people now experiencing acute food insecurity. Increasing, cli increasing climate variability and extremes are key drivers behind this as well as the direct impact. Climate change can also contribute to the issues that increase the risk of conflict, the other major driver of global food insecurity and hunger. But here's the good news that we've heard today. We have an abundance of evidence that data and digital technologies can help create healthier, more sustainable, and more equitable food systems. Technology can reduce inefficiencies, increase productivity, build resilience to climate change, attract more young people to the sector, and build more equitable services for women and youth in agriculture. All of this can and should help feed more people in the decades to come. Data and digital technologies have a particularly important role to play in helping people most affected by climate change to become more resilient, even in some of the toughest places. The challenge is for us to ensure that they do so, that, that they are accessible to all communities. I'll share with you one example from our own work at Mercy Corps. Um, as we know, the largest group of people most vulnerable to climate change are the world's two and a half billion small scale farmers, herders, fishers, and forest dependent communities. Since 2012, Mercy Corps' AgriFin initiative has brought together more than 150 private, public, and development sector partners to support the design, test, and scale of their digitally enabled products and services for smallholder farmers in eight countries across Africa plus Indonesia, reaching more than 16 million farmers in total. AgriFin acts as a catalyst at the hub of an ecosystem of farmers, buyers, suppliers, banks, mobile network operators, research institutions, and other partners. We listen and learn from smallholder farmers to understand their challenges and then work with partners to develop, test, and scale affordable, relevant products and services to help farmers adapt to climate change and build resilient businesses in the process. One example is crop insurance. In Kenya, we are working to leverage blockchain technology with Acre Africa to bring crop insurance to smallholders. And this has allowed us to get insurance payouts to farmers in two days instead of two months after a climate shock. So the solutions are there. How do we bring them to scale and make sure they reach the people who need them the most? We need to see major investments in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, particularly in climate vulnerable, fragile and conflict affected states. Today, only 25% of bilateral climate financing and less than 50% of the major multilateral climate financing has targeted the most climate vulnerable countries. The gap is even more stark in those that are conflict affected. At COP this week, we're calling on donors to increase climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction funding, making sure that it reaches those who need it the most. But funding alone is not enough. As everyone has highlighted today, we need to bring together multiple partners. None of these breakthrough solutions were developed by a single organization. Innovations like AgriFin are only possible where organizations like mine worked with governments, donors, the private sector, and critically communities themselves to develop solutions. We also need to ensure that all people can access the range of services they need. That means scaling digital platforms and marketplaces across Africa to bring together the full range of climate smart services that farmers urgently need. 
These approaches, like Digifarm and Twiga Foods in Kenya, Red D Alimentos in Chile, and Pindoro in China, have demonstrated their ability to reach millions of farmers, helping provide access to drought tolerant seeds, to reduce food loss, and leverage digital data to support financing, crop insurance, and climate smart advisory services. It also means designing platforms and services from the start so that everyone, women and men, those in remote, fragile or conflict affected places can use them. So let's seize on the momentum that we've built together, pushing forward data and digital solutions for food systems. And let's call on world leaders this week to help us bring solutions to scale, reaching the people who need them most. Thank you for all that you're doing in this effort. Great, thank you so much. Um, this is a really inspiring group of people and the cross sector, extremely global, um, both in terms of the, the large number of folks who showed up as well as the speakers. So I'm, I'm super inspired by all the content today. Thank you for bringing your stories and your solutions and driving your organizations. Um, I wanna make sure I get um, any questions for the group in, in the chat here. I'm not seeing so many, so I'll give you one minute or so. If you if you have something you'd like to to bring to the group, please go ahead and post. Um, otherwise, we will we will wrap it up. And um, and I don't know, if, Brian, if there's anything else you wanted to add for the group around sort of um, this call to action. You know how to follow up if they're curious. Um, we'll be able, we'll make this available the recording. But I also um, I know that this group is looking for collaborators. We're looking for um, additional people to join hands in action. So um, maybe to reiterate um, first how people can 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 get acquainted with more materials and also how to how to join in. Yeah, absolutely. I see I see a couple of questions coming in that would be would be cool to, to take some time for. But um, uh, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Federico Ronca at at, uh, at uh, World Economic Forum. I'm uh, b.king at cgir.org. Um, and, and as I said, we'll, we'll capture a little bit of information about um, what you're doing, what initiatives you have, and, and kind of where you see some potential uh, synergies and, and, and forest multiplication, as we've been saying, um, through, through, through joining up with the coalition. And so I'm, I'm happy, to, yeah, happy to facilitate that. Um, so, but I think maybe a, a bit of, a, a, we've got a, a couple of questions here that we can get into some of the technical depth, which um, I know we all appreciate. Okay. That's great. Let's start with uh, Mary Agnes's question here around the core data. So to either Parmesh, Tule, Elliot, um, who wants to take that one? Um, I can take a crack at it first. Um, obviously, I'd love to hear from other folks. So the question is, how many, um, I mentioned core data as the core of the one map. How many countries are missing this core data and how to create it? Um, I think the, the simple answer is most countries do not have this core data in an organized, standardized, and normalized way. When we talk about core data, things like um, field boundary identification, crop type classification historically, soil data maps, climate information. The da that data exists, but it often exists in, um, in these silos that you've heard us talk about. So it's um, a combination of creating the data in a, in a way that's shared as a global good, um, and then in a way that is easily accessible to multiple different players. Uh, so I think we're on a journey to um, start building this. There are, there are several government initiatives that are out trying to be, begin to create these core data maps. Uh, and I think what we'll hopefully see over the next few years are sort of really good reference examples where countries, maybe through the collaboration of this group, create these foundational data layers and then share how they've created them and how they they plan to um, identify and share them. But again, love to hear from other folks on the call of uh, specific examples of creating these country level core data maps. Eric, uh, I can come in uh, briefly on this. So I think Elliot is right in said that we don't have standardized four or five sets of foundational data uh, which are available country by country. So I think there is an element of uh, making sure that what are those data. So clearly I feel that digital farm registries, geocoded, georeferenced, 
soil maps, and then some other three, four data sources, if they were available across the board, uh, uh, wherever they are available, they, people innovate and develop product services and decision-making tools around that. But it's not standardized. Everyone goes in a very different kind of way. So we would like to pick up a set of countries uh, from this and really invest systematically. So our, our hypothesis is that for every $100 million we invest in a country in agriculture food systems, there should be at least 10 to 15 million on this foundational data. It is as important as infrastructure we are investing in, the you know farmer organizations we are investing in. So this is a new stream of investment, but it's not clear when we go and advise the governments what should we be investing in and how we should be doing it. So if we can pick up four or five countries, which where you can see the enabling countries are already there, and uh, Dr. Van der Fro, Thule, and all these people are the people where they are very keen to do it. And we have invested in a big data platform in Kenya, already $3.5 million, where a lot of micro weather data is already there. There's farm registry also there. So I think the question is now to bring it all together in a form in which, as Elliot said, it's interoperable and it's also usable and create 10 to 15 use cases out of that and then go from country to country and present it at a regional forum in Africa to all the countries as a strategic compact for the new kinds of investments we should do. Personally, as the bank, for every $5 million investment we do annually, I would like to invest in $50 million in data across countries. You know, But we still don't know what to do and how to do well. And so that's where we would like all of you to join in that coalition to work with us very intensively on that. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Parmesh. Um, I want to follow up on a question here from Felipe. Um, how do we see the role of tech startups contributing to these endeavors? Um, and maybe, I don't know if I can kick that to Helena or Tule to talk a little bit about um, that first. And uh, Helena, I guess Brian wants to jump in as well. Okay, go ahead. Go, go for it, Brian. If, go for it. Oh, just to underscore, and I think actually the, the Marketplace Playbook is a great example of this. Um, the, you know, creation of foundational data assets for the general public is kind of resembles a little bit what they used to say about radio and TV programming. Uh, programming for the general public is programming for nobody. And so recognizing that we need to be working with product and service developers from the outset so that we can inform what are relevant data assets? What are the kinds of analytics that are relevant to those product and service developers? And how do we know from the outset that they're kind of fit for purpose um, for those product and service developers? And so I think that's a really natural kind of point of interface um, with agri-food tech uh, startups. So I'd add um, in answer to that question at the core of it, um, you know, if you look at the examples that we uh, highlighted, they're, they're very recent. These are organizations that have started up sort of 2014, 2015, which when you start up a company, that, that's not a long time. It, you know, you have to work hard with blood, sweat and tears to get a company up and running. Um, and when hearing from the CEOs of these organizations, you could really see that, you know, they were applying a lot of expertise um, but they were thinking about the purpose. And what is really exciting about today's forward thinking startups is that they are uh, understanding the bigger picture, uh, the way in which the marketplace needs to be fundamentally different. Um, and uh, that sense of purpose is is very, uh, very much there. So I, I think that's at the heart of it. And we're trying to support those that um, and help those flourish um, that understand where we need to connect people and planet. And so to Tule, I think. Thanks, Helena. I mean, I said it in my um, my remarks, or you know, when I was when I when I presented. For us, it's fundamental to involve the tech startup ecosystem. I mean, Twigo was a startup, right? Um, and and there's a few others, Dukeri, and a few other companies that are, that just keep showing us that there's um, that they are fundamental to creating that uh, that marketplace, that ecosystem, and the availability of data. It's just the question of how do we access their data responsibly and use it responsibly, right? And then as um, government, at government level, and then also at World Bank type, um, at our, our DFI's levels, how do we then leverage the work they've done and then scale it? 
Um, because a lot of the startups, like Helen, Helena was saying, it's blood, sweat, and tears, and then in the end, we only hear about the really successful ones, and that's Twiga, I mean, $50 million raise, who has heard of that in Kenya, right? But we have a lot more others who are operating um, and are not as visible, and we just need to make sure that we can keep um, crowding them in and supporting them um, through partnerships like this and making visibility efforts, but also making sure that the money is available to, to invest in them as Amesh mentioned. So I'll hold you to that, Amesh. That's fantastic. Thank you. And just a reminder for folks who have questions, please put them into the chat here. And I'm trying to go through them uh, uh, as quickly as possible. But I think to Henry's question here, um, and Rick and I may call on you to answer this one just to give you a, a heads up. But you know, the question around how do we create the incentives for um, the, the, the private sector actors in the food system to create this foundational data new business models, how to attract startups. Um, so, so perhaps, um, Rick, if you're on, you could talk a little bit about the work at Digital Green and some of the innovative business models that you've been working on um, in, this, in this ecosystem. Oh, we may have lost you. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up then to see if there's anybody else on the, the panel who'd like to speak to um, this piece around the, the new business models for um, collaboration. So we can hand it over to Erica. Alicia. Oh, Alicia. Hey, welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please Hi. Go Rick, and, Rick and sent me a message saying he's on a train, so he's having a hard time um, participating. So I think your question was about um, what kinds of new models Digital Green is bringing to the table. And I think one I dropped in the chat for people to take a look at um, is FarmStack, which is a peer-to-peer -peer data connector to get to this issue of um, enabling trust as actors share across the ecosystem. Um, I'd encourage people to go uh, take a look at that, but we're, we're really excited at Digital Green to start to develop solutions that can enable the exchange of data across lots of different actors in a way that is fr more frictionless and is highly secure. Um, so I would encourage people with, with uh, just a minute or two left um, to take a look there. We think if the, if the solutions can, um, start to reduce that barrier to trust, we'll see a lot more solutions being developed that are responsive to farmer needs. And so this is speaking to some of the constraints uh, in, the, in the development of services that we're seeing right now. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's a question here from, from Simon Winter uh, um, around, how do we create competitive approach to have countries compete for these full force multiplier approaches with uh, uh, these cross country coalitions or these cross coalition activities? Um, and how can we get, uh, how can we best land productively in response to willing government leaders? Um, great question. Um, a lot of folks here can probably speak to that. I, I'm uh, curious on, on how we create that competition. I don't know, Tule, if you want to take that or somebody from, from the World Bank, perhaps. It looks like, um, I don't know if Parmesh is still on here. Um, I can come very briefly on this. So I think uh, initially we have a limited number of countries where we have enabling ecosystems there. So what we are doing in World Bank, we have policy loans. And so in Kenya, particularly, uh, we uh, really developed a policy loan on e-vouchers for fertilizer and others that the government decided to change policies. And so for each policy change, you get a certain amount of uh, specific loan it's for policies basically so digitization say of all the farmer data registration and all so we call it program for results and we have done this now in morocco where the government has really uh, uh, did major kind of changes in data digitization and all that in response to that that's not done as a kind of an investment but it's done as a results based kind of incentives the second uh, area which is coming through in context of the cop 26 is that how do you move from fertilizer, chemical fertilizer uh, subsidies to fertility, soil fertility incentives, which are really looking at your specific soil map and then allowing you to make changes to not give chemical fertilizers to everyone, but have range of fertility improvements. But that's very much dependent on data. So program for results and policy loans. These are the two where we are trying to incentivize the governments to move in that direction. Not easy. You can only do this where the governments are <laughs> interested in changing policies based on data, but not on perceptions. And there are lots of other political and other considerations. That's a complex 
kind of a field. And so you can't do this in across the country, announce a competition, and then suddenly you will have uh, four countries saying we'll do it. It has to be done brick by brick in terms of trust and dialogue at the country level. It, it will not follow the traditional competitive space, which the private sector is very used to. I just want to add to what Pamesh said, because I know it's we're almost out of time. Um, it's also about like the political buy-in, right? It's very important to to for the you know for the leadership to want to create that open environment and, and want to create an open ecosystem for data sharing and data availability. I mean, we there's a lot of lip service I've seen, I'm sorry to say, with my counterpart countries. Um, where we say we're moving towards digital, but then as soon as um, you know people are, are connected, we get restricted about the access to internet and the ability to keep communication lines open. And for I mean, you know, I, I, I think it's very key and critical for a, a country's government to want to remain open. Otherwise, you know, if it's open and closed, you stifle that innovation, um, and, and and people tend to pull back. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so I just want to say, I know we're at time. Thank you everyone for such engaging um, discussion and questions here today. We couldn't quite get through everything, but this is not the end. This is really just the beginning and, and we will um, continue to have events coming off the back of this as well as um, a, a lot of collaborative work to, to keep things moving along. So thanks for joining um, and we look forward to seeing you all in the field. <laughs> Take care. Okay, well.